Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Healthline webinar from the American Association of Kidney Patients. Get the facts, COVID-19 monoclonal antibody treatments and immunosuppressed kidney patients. My name is Erin Kale, and I am Director of Patient Insights, Data Analytics, and Advocacy for AAKP. I oversee our patient education and grassroots engagement activities, including our ambassador initiative, which comprises highly motivated and engaged patients and caregivers around the country and the globe. These individuals have a direct connection to kidney disease and wish to raise awareness and provide support to others navigating the challenges of this chronic disease. AAKP's Healthline webinars fall under our Center for Patient Research and Education. We believe patient and caregiver education is an integral part of treatment and protection of patient lives, and we work to ensure that the patient has a central role in research and guidance that are designed to determine optimal approaches and strategies for providing healthcare services, assistance programs, and access to new products and services. This is especially true during national emergencies such as the coronavirus pandemic. At this time, I'd like to introduce AAKP's president, Richard Knight. Richard is a former in-center hemodialysis patient who received a kidney transplant 15 years ago. Richard, I turn things over to you. First, I would like to thank everyone who has shown a concern for kidney patients and a continued threat that COVID-19 represents. Secondly, I would like to thank Dr. Shanka for sharing her time and expertise with us today. I think all of us know at this point that COVID-19 is a serious threat to all Americans and certainly a threat to those of us who are immunosuppressed, such as kidney patients. That includes myself and many of you in the listening audience today. But our webinar today is a little bit different because what we're gonna talk about today in several instances may in fact save your lives. Uh, during the past five months, I've had the opportunity to review many articles as much as 200 articles that are tracking the monoclonal antibodies activities within several states, um, read articles from several different publications have talked with the chief medical officers of many of the dialysis providers, that including the big two, David and Fresenius, as well as several of the smaller nonprofit ones, to really have the type of research that would help myself and AAKP frame a plan that we could share with our patient members about what to do. First, we strongly advocate and recommend that everyone get vaccinated. I've had my shots, Pfizer, and I've even had my third shot. But one of the questions that we have to face is that what happens if the vaccination doesn't protect us? And that is one of the topics that Dr. Shanka will be discussing today with regard to the treatment option of monoclonal antibodies, or MADS for short. Now, we are not recommending that this is something that be done in lieu of the vaccination, but in the event you're in a situation like myself, you're older like myself, and you happen to catch this virus, it won't prevent it from happening, but it will lessen the impact of it. And she will certainly go into the details and the science behind that. And in addition, my colleague, Paul Conway, who I will turn it over to in a minute, will provide you with some additional information and insights from folks like yourself that also helped us frame the discussion that we're gonna to have today. But finally, I wanna ask that each of you who are listening today or watching in, that you share this information with your fellow patients and with others so that we can help them get educated and become as up to date as possible on the current status of COVID-19 and on possible treatment alternatives. Now, I'm gonna turn it over to my good friend and colleague and fellow transplant recipient, who's going to discuss some of that data that I just mentioned, Paul Conway. Paul? Thank you very much, Richard. 
And uh, like Richard Knight, I'm a, a fellow transplant patient. I'm nearly 25 years out on my kidney transplant. And Richard and I have had the pleasure of uh, helping craft at AAKP uh, a very strong and uh, robust division called the Center for uh, Patient Education and Research. And what we've done in that division is in implemented the latest polling tools to make certain that before any type of event we do at AAKP or any discussion we have with elected or appointed leaders, we have the freshest insights possible from the patients who belong to AAKP and patients outside of AAKP to make certain that we're doing programming that's based on your interests and where you are in your decision making. And for today's topic in particular, this is very important. There's been a tremendous amount of information and disinformation on the media and in social media about the role of vaccines, especially among high-risk populations like ours, kidney patients that manage many other diseases oftentimes besides their kidney disease. One of the first questions that we put out is we asked patients if they're aware of the seriousness of COVID and the strong uh, complications that can ensue from an infection. And here, uh, a tribute to patients like you, you're educating one another and your medical professionals are working closely with you. 94% are aware of the fact that it's uh, a very severe threat to you. And in this slide, uh, we asked the question about third dose. Our organization was very active uh, in encouraging the FDA to approve third dose uh, of the vaccine for immunocompromised. And since that time, we were asking patients whether or not they've had an opportunity to be aware of it and to have access to it. And you can see 51% are saying yes, 44% are saying no. This is about seven or, weeks, seven or eight weeks out from approval. In terms of a vaccine, how many have actually gone ahead and gotten the third dose or have gotten their second dose? You can see it's pretty much a mixed picture here. 44% have gotten two doses, 45% have gotten three doses. And what it means is that after the decision, people are in the process of acting on the information that they have to get their third dose to get maximum security. So we're in the process of taking the information on the approval and acting on it. And so uh, in this slide, you see those who are considering third dose, 69%, which is a great number. In terms of understanding monoclonal antibodies in particular uh, and how they can help, uh, you can see the awareness that is already out there about the issue of monoclonal antibodies, which is very good. Nearly 70% have heard about it. And the point of today's discussion is to get into the exact details of how you can benefit uh, from it uh, if you are exposed or become infected. So in this particular side, we asked the question on whether or not if the FDA approves monoclonal antibodies for proactive treatment of patients, uh, would they consider taking it as a part of a regimen? 77% say yes, which is a positive sign. We see all of these indications of awareness of the threat of COVID, the follow through on third dosing, and on the awareness of monoclonal as a very strong base of information that people are gonna be making their decisions on. And in this particular question, we're asking if your medical professional uh, indicates that you're eligible for it as a preventative, would you consider it? Again, 69% uh, would in fact consider it, 29% are unsure, meaning they need more information. And it's, again, part of the point why we're doing this presentation today. In this one, we were interested because of much of what has been uh, out on the internet and in social media, uh, whether individuals would consider doing monoclonal antibody treatment uh, in lieu of getting a vaccine. And here, the, the numbers are very strong. The answer, no, 49% of people saying, no, we wouldn't substitute it. As far as folks who are unsure, 36%. And we think this is important because what it means is there's more education to do to make certain that people understand this is a tool in the toolbox, not a substitute for vaccination. In this question, we wanted a baseline of uh, how many folks in the survey uh, had been uh, tested positive for COVID-19. Fortunately, only 15%, 85% are following procedures, trying to stay safe and uh, have not been uh, tested positive for COVID-19. And then we wanted to know those who did test positive for COVID-19, where were they in terms of their treatment? 30% had had two doses, 13% uh, had had three doses, but probably the most important number here that reaffirms the science that we've heard from our experts over the past 18 months is that those who are not vaccinated are most at risk. So of the 15% who were diagnosed with COVID-19, 52% of them 
were not vaccinated. That's a good reminder for everybody watching. And for those who were admitted to the hospital, 13 percent uh, were admitted to the hospital, 87 percent. Those who were not uh, infected, obviously, were not. But of the 13 percent who were hospitalized, were very interested in uh, what their experience was. In summary, we have a very good base of knowledge across the patient community. Folks are doing their due diligence after the FDA has approved the third dose. Most of them are trying to engage with their medical teams and ask about it. Most of them are trying to access it and get their third vaccine dose. And there's a general awareness that monoclonal antibodies are an important tool in the toolbox. Today, what we'll do is go through and give you even more information in great detail for the types of questions that you need to ask, how the antibody treatment actually works, and how it's working to help save patient lives across the United States with one of the best practitioners from one of the best transplant programs that at George Washington University. So I'll toss it back over to you, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. And thank you, Richard, for opening the webinar up for us today. And also a special thank you out to um, all of those who are listening today who completed our flash survey on COVID doses. We appreciate your insights. And as you can see, we, we use these insights for uh, a number of things, um, especially um, encouraging participation and, and hoping to inform uh, change. I'd now like to introduce our guest speaker for today's webinar, Dr. Divya Shanka. She is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Kidney Diseases and Hypertension at the George Washington University. She is board certified in internal medicine and completed her nephrology and transplantation medicine training from Whale Cornell. Her clinical interests include precision medicine for genetic cause of kidney disease, immunosuppression for transplantation, management of rejection in transplant patients, and COVID-related kidney disease. She has several publications in high-impact journals in topics ranging from urinary cell transcriptomics in acute rejection to dialysis in COVID-19 patients. Thank you, Dr. Shanka, for joining us today to share information about the COVID-19 vaccine and monoclonal antibody treatment for immunosuppressed kidney patients. I now turn things over to you. Thank you, Erin, and I want to thank AKP for taking this um, very important initiative. As we already saw in the survey, what a difference um, knowledge can do to patients. And as we know, knowledge is power. So the more our patients know, the better they know how to protect themselves and their family from this pandemic that has been ongoing since last year. So diving right into the topic. So we know that COVID has been wreaking havoc in a lot of our lives for the past since last year. Compared to what the pandemic was in 1918, we know that this past year we've experienced a lot of personal losses and as healthcare professionals, we've also lost a lot of patients. Compared to the previous pandemics that have happened right now, as of October 18, the debt toll due to COVID is a staggering 723,000. And it only reminds us that what a, a devastating effect this pandemic has had on all lives throughout the world. The initial, when the pandemic initially started, the biggest question was, is this pandemic affecting everyone or is it choosing people um, who are falling ill to this disease? So this study that was published in November, 2020, looked at 157 hospitalized patients who otherwise did not have any other comorbidities and they were otherwise considered healthy. And in them, we saw that the mortality was as high as 25%. So what we learned from here was that a lot of healthy patients, people were also um, uh, succumbing to this disease. But what we also know that a lot more patients who are getting COVID are also recovering from this disease. So almost 90% of people who get COVID recover from it. So what is most important is to avoid or reduce the number of hospitalizations, reduce the number of people who develop any kidney problem, reduce the number of people who require to be admitted to the ICU, need mechanical ventilation or die. So while the uh, disease is highly prevalent, these major adverse effects or uh, outcomes are what we are trying to reduce as much as possible in all our patients. That was about healthy people. What about patients on dialysis? 
This study that was published in AGKD um, looked at 26 facilities across 29 states in the in, in United States. And if you were on dialysis, the prevalence of COVID was up to 6%. And within these people who were on dialysis, up to 29% died because of COVID. So even among uh, dialysis patients, COVID-19 was leading to a high rate of mortality. And then coming to patients, the special population of patients who are on immunosuppressants who received organ transplantation, what was the effect of COVID on patients with the kidney transplant recipients? And this study compared transplant recipients with matched cohort who were not on immunosuppression, who were not uh, recipients of a transplant. And in them, we saw that compared to the non-transplant patients, the transplant patients had a higher rate of acute kidney injury. They required higher rates of dialysis and compared to 11.4% mortality in the non-transplant patients, in the transplant patients, the mortality was also comparatively higher. So we know that COVID does cause a lot of kidney injury, increases your need for dialysis and death in patients who've been, who've received a kidney transplant. Now, having understood that this disease affects a lot of people, probably doesn't differentiate between one individual to the another, it becomes very important to understand how exactly our body equips itself when it's attacked by a virus. When a virus affects, uh, in, uh, gets into our body, there are a lot of things that happen within our immune system that makes the body, the immune system uh, equipped to tackle the uh, virus or the bacteria effectively. Now, this immune system is highly evolved. It is very complex. And we know that over the years of evolution, it has almost perfected the way it attacks and destroys the foreign pathogen. When, whenever there's a virus that um, gets into our body, the way our body recognizes what kind of pathogen it is, is based on certain proteins that are present over the surface of the virus. In this image on the surface of the virus, I've shown two receptors in the color yellow, which are representative of certain uh, proteins on the surface of the virus. It is these proteins that are present on each pathogen that the body's immune system is able to identify and specifically target. And the way it uh, aims to destroy this is by two mechanisms. One is the antibody response and the other is a cell mediated response. The antibody response is elicited when the proteins that are recognized on the surface of the virus triggers the B cells to produce a set of proteins, which we call antibodies. And these antibodies are highly specific only for this specific protein. So if there was any other virus or bacteria that entered the body that did not have the same similar protein on top of it, this antibody that is directed against the virus will not affect the other bacteria. Similarly, there's another process called the cell mediated process where there are certain cells in our body, namely lymphocytes or NK cells that are highly specific and target to destroy these viruses. Just like the antibodies, these cell-mediated responses are also highly um, targeted towards the target that it needs to attack. And one of the most important characteristic of our immune system is it always remembers. So the first time that you're exposed to an antigen, let's say that the body creates a certain amount of antibody. The second time you're exposed to the same antigen, the amount of antibody, the time taken for the response is much shorter so that the second time the antigen is um, exposed in our body, the body's immune system is able to control it in a much quicker, quicker uh, period of time. So in a sense, it's not just that the army is sitting um, a, um, waiting for command. The next time there's an antigen, the army is ready to attack as soon as the antigen enters. This way, the body is able to curb the infection effectively with minimal collateral damage to the rest of the body. So this is a general overview of how the immune um, system tar uh, manages most of the infections that affect our body. So what, what happens when COVID, the SARS-CoV virus enters our body? 
So the best way to always understand what happens in a human body, we learn from um, a lot of evidence that comes from animal studies. So similar to uh, all other diseases that we've known so far in humankind, um, there have been a lot of studies looking to see how our body is able to tackle against this SARS-CoV virus. So in this um, study that was published in Nature in 2021, um, it showed animal data, which shows that both the antibody response and the cell mediated response is protective against COVID. They looked at the uh, rhesus macaque monkeys and what they saw was the transfer of antibodies from convalescent monkeys into naive recipients induced protection against the COVID. What they also saw was that the T cells, which is the cells responsible for the cell mediated response, when they depleted these cells, the protection from the virus was de also depleted. So in a sense, what it means is that the cellular immune response also contributes to the protection if the antibody responses are suboptimal. And this is important in SARS-CoV vaccine because the vaccines should be able to induce both a potent and durable humoral as well as cellular immune responses. Idea of vaccination has long been prevalent and we know that a lot of uh, all our transplant recipients do get annual flu shot also to protect us from influenza. So the knowledge that in transplant recipients, they have less antibodies produced against uh, when, when they are vaccinated is not new. We know that even from the influenza data that the efficacy in vaccination in patients on immunosuppression is lesser than the general population. So in this study, which was uh, back in 2011, they showed that the antibodies that are produced in solid organ transplant recipients is much lesser compared to control subjects. So when it comes to uh, COVID uh, again and vaccination for COVID, the most important question for scientists was, if the vaccine works, what kind of responses is the vaccine eliciting and how protective is it against the disease itself? So in this study, which looked to study the, the um, effect of two doses of COVID vaccine. It was a single center study in which 658 kidney transplant recipients who had received two doses of the mRNA vaccine was, were enrolled. Among them, 357 of those recipients, which is 54%, had antibodies detectable after two doses. Now, it's very important to interpret these studies with the caveat that these studies only measure a laboratory value. So, the level of antibody which is considered protective has still not been exactly established. And also what we measure at that time is just a snapshot of a blood test value at that period of time. And it does not necessarily account for the memory response that our body's immune system will elicit. So what this means is if you have a certain level of antibody, it doesn't mean that if you do get the if you are exposed to the virus, that the level of the antibody will not go up because of the immune response that we know our body will be able to mount. This study um, looked to see, apart from the humoral, the antibody response, does the vaccine also elicit a cellular response? So in this study, there were 117 uh, recipients, including both kidney transplant recipients and kidney and pancreas recipients, who were COVID naive, so who hadn't been exposed to COVID, but had received two doses of the mRNA vaccine. So what they saw was that in this population, 30% of them developed an antibody response, which they measured by measuring the antibody against the specific pr spike protein that the um, vaccine elicits. 55% of them had a cellular response that they measured by a test called Elispot and 20% had responses to both the uh, antibody and the cellular response. So this data is encouraging that the vaccine probably elicits both an antibody mediated response and a cellular response, which together are very important to protect us from the virus. Having gone through all this data, is a third dose really required? Um, and if so, how does it help us? So this was a, a very good study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was a double blind randomized control trial. So we usually consider studies like this to be the highest level of evidence because the, the, the 
it um, studies a control group and a, 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 the population on which we are testing the drug. So it included 120 um, solid organ transplant recipients. And the main um, study outcome was to see whether the uh, people who got the third dose were able to mount a higher antibody response. So to break this down in panel A, what you see is that in patients who received the, the third dose, you saw that the level of the anti-RBD antibody levels were much higher than patients who received the placebo. So these were patients um, who had received two doses and they were checking to see if a third dose would add to the protection. Similarly, in panel D on the image, when you look at it, that is, to, uh, that is showing the cellular response that the third dose elicited. Again, we see that the response uh, that was elicited after a third dose was much higher compared to a placebo. The vaccination definitely works. It has helped to protect us from a lot of death and hospitalizations that otherwise would not be averted. And this increase in, uh, interesting article that was published in the New York Times, the red line, the, the yellow line shows, had we let the pandemic um, progress along the same lines as it was, what would have been the predicted death? And the red line shows what actually happened because we were able to intervene timely with vaccines. So these vaccinations have actually averted up to 140,000 lives, which would have otherwise been lost. As of October 2012, this is the data from the CDC. Total vaccinated have been 189 million people. And among these who have been vaccinated, those who were hospitalized for other non-fatal reasons was 24,000. And those who have died in spite of vaccination is 7,178. 7, so compared to our initial slides where we saw that the mortality was up to 25%, what this shows is that vaccination definitely works and it has definitely helped to reduce the uh, number of deaths um, because of COVID. In this study, which looked at 24 hospitals across 14 states, it was to assess the rates of COVID-associated hospitalization among 414 adults who were aged more than 65, 65 or older. What it showed was that after second dose, the rates of being hospitalized was reduced by up to 94%. So getting the vaccine definitely reduces the need for hospitalization, which means that you probably might develop some symptoms, but they are not severe enough that you need to be hospitalized. This study looked at what was the mortality rate between patients who've been vaccinated and compared them to patient people who were not vaccinated. So this is data from the UK, which include all um, solid organ transplant recipients um, in their database to see if vaccination reduced the rates of hospitalization and death. And according to their database, as of uh, July 9th, when the study was done, up to 82%, which was 39,000, almost 40,000 people had received both doses of vaccine. And you can see clearly that in the deaths in COVID positive patients, compared to the unvaccinated patients where the death rate was 12.6%, those who had received the two doses of the vaccine, the death rate was as low as 7.7%. So vaccination reduces your rate of hospitalization and it reduces the day rates of death. A lot of my patients have asked me that if they've caught COVID once, do they need to be vaccinated again? Don't they have natural protection from the disease itself? Why do we need to vaccinate them again? So to answer this question about what was the reinfection rates in non-vaccinated adults compared to vaccinated adults, um, this study was done in Kentucky, which looked at the association of SARS-CoV reinfection with COVID-19 vaccination status. So what they did was they looked at the people who had contracted COVID in 2020 and among those who had been vaccinated and who had not been vaccinated, they compared their rates of being reinfected with the virus. And what they saw was that the Kentucky residents who were not vaccinated had up to 2.3 times the odds of reinfection compared to those who were fully vaccinated.
I'm sure a lot of you have been hearing about breakthrough after vaccination. There are a lot of patients that we saw in our survey as well who had contracted COVID even though they had been vaccinated. So this is not just in immunosuppressed patients. Even in this article that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, just this month, it looked at the uh, COVID-19 breakthrough infection in vaccinated healthcare workers. So what they did was they um, saw that after two doses of vaccination in 1400 healthcare workers, they saw that 39 of them had breakthrough infections. So the breakthrough rate in these patients, 39 out of 1400 had um, COVID again. But what is most important is that most breakthrough cases were very mild or almost asymptomatic and 19% of them had persistent symptoms, but these symptoms were mostly related to fatigue, body ache uh, or loss of smell, but they were not serious enough to be hospitalized or require ICU admission. But what do these breakthroughs look like in immunocompromised patients? So um, this study is from the University of Miami, Florida. They looked at um, 2,957 2 solid organ transplant recipients and among which 26 of them had breakthrough infections. So within these 26 people, um, 23 of them had received two doses of the vaccine and three of them had received only one dose of the vaccine. So overall, their breakthrough rates were as low as 0.87%. All were symptomatic, but these symptoms only ranged from fever, fatigue, some had nausea, diarrhea, myalgia, some had sore throat and sore um, cough, but um, <clears throat> nothing more serious than that. 12 or 46% of them were being able, were managed outpatient with early administration of the monoclonal antibody with complete recovery and up to 50% of them required hospitalization. And even those who were hospitalized, two of them were admitted after they had received the outpatient monoclonal antibody for monitoring them. 92% of them were treated with the antiviral and steroids. Five of them, which is 19%, had severe COVID and two of them had died. So what are these monoclonal antibodies and how do they really work? And is this the first time that monoclonal antibodies are being heard of in the scientific world? So if you look at the first panel, whenever our body is attacked by any virus, as we previously saw, our body responds by producing a number of antibodies. These antibodies are usually polyclonal, which means they react to many different pathogens. So these polyclonal antibodies, which are circulating in our body, then travel through the blood and whenever they encounter the virus, they go and attack the virus and are able to destroy it. If you look at panel C, what, how is uh, monoclonal antibodies formed? So the way this happens is, from the convalescent um, uh, blood of someone who's recovering from an infection, we are able to extract the cells which produce the antibody. We are able to develop the antibody from that specific cell. So this antibody is highly specific now for the infection for which the um, body has created the antibody. And using genetic engineering, this specific antibody is manufactured and cloned so that we develop a large, uh, a big number of these monoclonal antibodies. So these monoclonal antibodies are very specific. They can only go and uh, target and attach to that specific protein against which this monoclonal antibody has been formed. So there are monoclonal antibodies that are used in cancer treatments. There are monoclonal antibodies that are used in treatments of rejection. And then there are monoclonal antibodies that are used in the treatment of COVID. So each of these monoclonal antibodies are highly specific for the reason, for the cause for which they were developed. And the development of monoclonal antibodies is actually also very um, tedious and highly specific. So specific to COVID itself, the monoclonal antibody uh, that, were, that have been developed they were actually um, developed from the blood of convalescent serum of a human subject. The blood from the human subject is taken. They remove, they isolate the uh, lymphocytes from these cells. From these um, cells, they extract the antibody. 
From this antibody through genetic engineering, they look at which one is the best antibody that will bind to COVID and destroy it. And then through genetic engineering again, this antibody is then cloned so that we can develop a large number of these monoclonal antibodies that will be very specific to target against COVID. For post-exposure prophylaxis, three drugs have received emergency use authorization from the FDA for use in mild to moderate COVID. The three drugs are bamlinimimab and etesivimab, the combination, then casirivimab and imdevimab combination, and sotrovimab by itself. The drugs are given as a single in intravenous infusion, and the, pers the, the patient who uh, these drugs, uh, or these uh, monoclonal antibodies will be effective are those who have been unvaccinated, or people who are vaccinated but not expected to mount an adequate response, such as the immunocompromised um, kidney patients and patients on dialysis, or people who are at a high risk for progression for severe disease. So the NIH lists um, a long list of uh, people who it considers as a high risk, including people who are more than 65 years of age, those who are obese, those who have diabetes, um, who had uh, who have uh, COPD or chronic lung disease, those who are on immunosuppressant medications, those who have CKD. But overall, um, clinically, what we have been seeing is any, any of our patients who may be even admitted for any reason other than being COVID and are tested positive for COVID, if our clinical concern is that they are at a high risk to develop severe COVID, even if they have been vaccinated, uh, we have been consulting with our uh, infectious disease colleagues and they have been getting these monoclonal antibodies. Now, what is important about these monoclonal antibodies is that they have to be given as soon as possible or at least within seven to 10 days of exposure. And this is only specific for patients who have mild to moderate COVID. That is, let's say you have a household member who's had COVID and you are an immunosuppressed patient and you are concerned about your risk of developing COVID and you probably have only a mild cough or not even that, just lost your sense of smell, you would be an excellent candidate to receive the monoclonal antibody because we want to prevent you from developing severe disease. So this um, study published in the New England Journal of Medicine looked at one of these monoclonal antibody, the region COVE, in which 1,500 asymptomatic healthy people who were more than 12 years of age were enrolled and those who had a household contact with SARS-CoV. It was a multi-center randomized control trial. And what it showed was that um, those who received the monoclonal antibody, there was a relative risk reduction of up to 81% um, reduction in risk of requiring hospitalizations. So compared to placebo, people who received the monoclonal antibody, it reduced the risk of hospitalization or developing severe disease because of COVID. This other monoclonal antibody that was also studied and published in New England Journal of Medicine, this was again another uh, double-blind randomized control trial in which uh, 1,000 people who were high-risk ambulatory patients, so again, they were more than 12 years of age who had mild to moderate COVID, they received either the monoclonal antibody or the placebo, and it showed that the rates of hospitalization was much lesser in those who received the monoclonal antibody, and the rates of death also was much lower in those who received the monoclonal antibody. The incidence of serious adverse events um, following the monoclonal antibody was very low and similar to almost the placebo. And none of the patients uh, who were enrolled in the study had to be discontinued because of any adverse effects from the monoclonal antibody. These monoclonal antibodies also uh, were able to reduce the viral load. In this graph shown in the yellow line, you see that the viral load starts coming down uh, compared to the placebo and within, uh, within a week, the viral load was much lower in those who received the monoclonal antibody uh, they tested the viral load both in the upper and the lower respiratory tract in the study. What is the data that we have about these monoclonal antibodies in patients who've, who are immunocompromised, such as the patients that we take care of? We do not have any randomized control trial yet, 
but there is one that is ongoing by Gupta et al, the Comet Ice study, which is still uh, not yet peer reviewed, in which they studied the monoclonal antibody in patients who were considered high risk. So these were patients more than 55 years of age, or if they had diabetes, if they had obesity, if they had CKD, um, congestive heart failure or COPD. The drug that is being studied is sotrovimab. And so far from the preliminary outcomes that they have, it showed that there's a reduction in hospitalization to 1% compared to 7% in the placebo group. And risk of severe progression of the disease was less than 1% compared to 7% in the placebo group. Similarly, there are other case control studies that have looked, in, looked at patients who have been recipients of uh, solid organ transplants. And it had showed that it has shown that in these retrospective studies, these monoclonal antibodies have reduced the rates of progression of severe illness, reduced the rates of hospitalizations and mechanical ventilation. Um, in all of these studies, um, there have not been any reported adverse events from these solid organ transplant uh, in these uh, transplant recipients. And in fact, in the study by Yetmer et al, the concern about if there's any rejection, possibilities of rejection, they had even conducted biopsies in five of their uh, kidney transplant recipients and they did not find any sign of rejection because of these monoclonal antibodies. There are certain other groups of immunocompromised patients who are just not able to mount the response not because of being on immunosuppressants but because of some defects in their body's immune system. So there are certain some case reports that have been published about these patients. So in one of the studies, it, they used this monoclonal antibody for the treatment of persistent COVID in a patient who had hypogamma globinilemia, and they found that the monoclonal antibody was able to clear the virus. And in patients with B cell depletion therapy, in one paper, uh, this was a patient with multiple sclerosis who was on a uh, immunosuppressive uh, treatment and two patients with lymphoma who were on rituximab which is which also reduces your body's immunity. In these case reports patients who had prolonged and severe COVID they were successfully treated with monoclonal antibodies. So far we looked at the use of monoclonal antibodies in post-exposure prophylaxis that is you've been exposed to someone who had COVID and you are worried that you may also develop COVID as a result of this exposure. Studies are now ongoing to see if these monoclonal antibodies can be used pre-exposure. That is, you take it regularly and even before you get exposed. So there's a trial that's ongoing, the PROVEN trial, which is studying this particular drug, which is a combination of two long-acting antibodies. The antibody has been modified so that it will have a longer half-life to uh, so that it will last, its effect will last longer in the body. It's expected to be a single dose of an intramuscular injection. Um, the preliminary data sh so far shows that it reduced the risk of symptomatic COVID by up to 77%. But again, a lot more data is awaited regarding its safety. How frequently does it need to be used? Whether there'll be any um, adverse events or side effects if there is repeated injection of this antibody repeatedly. So a lot more data is now awaited. To put all this in a succinct manner and to summarize, how do these monoclonal antibodies compare to vaccination? We know that vaccination, as we saw earlier, it elicits both the active humoral, active antibody response and the cell-mediated response. So it is a more of an active process. So no matter when the virus enters the body, because you've been vaccinated, you'll be, you'll be able to mount an Im immune response to it at any time. Whereas the monoclonal antibody is a passive immunity, it is only going to last as long as that particular antibody lasts in your body. And if you are exposed to the virus again, your body will not be able to mount an antibody response again. The vaccination will, uh, there is a memory response that will be elicited as a result of vaccination, whereas the monoclonal antibody do not elicit a memory response. So far from what we know for the vaccination, we need about two to three doses with possibly a booster that might be needed every year, whereas the monoclonal antibody will need to be redosed each time there's an exposure. 
both the vaccination and the monoclonal antibody long term safety is still no unknown but we do know so far that the short term there have not been any adverse immediate adverse reactions to these injections so the bottom line that i personally wanted from this talk was to get to you that what is the knowledge you need to equip yourself with and what is known and what is unknown because a lot of misinformation is spreading based on what is unknown which is taking away the benefits of what we can derive from the treatments and preventive measures that are available right now so the bottom line is our understanding about covid-19 is still evolving SARS-CoV-2 infected a lot of people but we also know a significant proportion of them recovered as well and what really counts is whether you get sick enough to require oxygen develop organ damage or need the icu care or die and we know that vaccination definitely protects you from all of these immunocompromised patients are at a high risk for complications we know that you can still get covid after vaccination but vaccination definitely protects you from serious disease or from death monoclonal antibodies are an alternative in high risk patients who do not mount an adequate immune response to vaccination thank you so much thank you so much dr shanka for providing this important information that was a great presentation thank you we have received thank several you. questions from our audience that we hope you will address Yes. For a transplant patient, how do we know that we've that we're adequately vaccinated against COVID-19? So, as we've gone through all the data that I showed just now, so far what we have um available, we um rec we've been having patients go and test for the antibody levels that are available in uh, in laboratory. but you know at the end of it whether the vaccine protects you or not it will it only depends on if you are if you are exposed to the virus whether you get sick enough our presence of the antibody does not mean that or, or low levels of antibodies does not mean that you are not protected against the virus or uh, not protected from the infection what we do know is that a lot of people who have been vaccinated um have been able to protect themselves from the disease so for transplant patients to know whether you are protected from the um, virus or not you will have to look at both the immune uh, the antibody levels and the cell mediate response but overall what we've been seeing is that the rates of infection in uh, vaccinated transplant recipients has been much lower so is the monoclonal antibodies treatment a safe treatment for kidney transplant patients and can you talk about how it affects the patient sure so from the data that we have so far which is based on a lot of um retrospective studies it appears that the monoclonal antibodies have been safe i've used it in a in a lot of our patients who've been admitted with covid and they've not um had any side effects that we know of and there were there are particularly two papers that even looked into to see whether these patients had any risk of rejections or other side effects so from the data that we have so far it appears to be safe in transplant recipients if you have a robust response to vaccine the vaccines and you still get infected will monoclonal antibody treatment still be effective and will it affect your previous antibody level Yeah so we do know that there has been uh, there have been breakthrough infections in our transplant patients even after they have received two doses or some even third dose of vaccine um, um many of my patients also um contracted covid after receiving two doses and were treated with the monoclonal antibody so yes even if you have been vaccinated if you get reinfected with the um covid um you will be a can candidate to receive the monoclonal antibody the main criteria or the main goal of these monoclonal antibodies is to prevent you from developing severe covid or and prevent you from getting hospitalized so you should let your healthcare providers know as soon as you think you have been exposed so that you will be a, you will be able to receive the monoclonal antibody um as far as the question about will it reduce the effect of the protection you get from the vaccine as i already mentioned 
the antibody is highly specific for that particular protein against the virus. So it will not target any other proteins or antibodies in you. So if you've already formed antibodies against the virus, this monoclonal antibody is not going to reduce the response that you've already developed. And can you talk about when it would be time to possibly stop getting vaccines and go only with um, the monoclonal antibodies? Personally, the answer will be never. Uh, I still highly recommend that all transplant patients and everyone in the general population should be getting vaccinated because the vaccine is probably the only shield that we have against the virus so far. To depend on only getting the monoclonal antibody and not get the vaccine um, will be a little bit of a gamble because that would be that would mean that you don't have any anything protecting you right now and you're constantly having to uh, receive these these antibodies monthly and. As far as pre-exposure prophylaxis using the antibodies, we still are awaiting the full data, although it has been shown to reduce the um, rates of severe infection. There are side effects from constantly receiving a monoclonal antibody again and again. So um, definitely continue. We, we should definitely increase our rates of vaccination. That definitely is probably the, one of the most important thing that will protect us from this disease. Thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, another question from one of our audience members is, I went into advanced stage four kidney failure from a biologic and I'm currently stable at stage three. I'm concerned the monoclonal medications could injure my kidneys further. What does the science show? Um, I would need a little bit more information because a lot of biologics are now available that are used in the scientific world. Um, there, there are biologics that are used against cancers. There are biologics used in the treatments of autoimmune disease and the treatments of rejection. So it depends on what kind of biologic was used. My best guess is it might have been a biologic that is used in treatments of certain cancers or autoimmune disease. Um, so without that information, I, 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 I'm not fully able to answer the first part, but what I can really, like what I can definitely say is that that biologic was manufactured or targeted a different protein, whereas this monoclonal antibody against COVID is specifically against COVID. So it does not um, increase your risk for worsening of kidney failure or does not increase your risk of rejection from what we've seen so far. So using the term monoclonal antibody to, to, to people in the general population, it sounds like a very new therapy, but in the scientific world, we've used monoclonal antibodies in a wide variety of diseases. So it's very important to know exactly which monoclonal antibody that you're talking about and what kind of response or what kind of effect it has on its on our body to understand what kind of side effect it will have and whether it will cause progression of kidney disease. Thank you. That's really, really helpful. Um, so what are the, the long term side effects? Um, is there a, a time frame of when monoclonal antibodies are most effective? Uh, and can you provide any additional information about the safety or the um, content or ingredients of uh, that monoclonal antibody that you speak of? Um, the knowledge, like I said, is still evolving. We are still learning a lot more. So it's only been it's only been one and a half years since the pandemic started and monoclonal antibodies are relatively new as well. So the long term effects of these monoclonal antibodies will we'll only know once we have more data on all of this. As far as the time duration within which the antibody should be given, um, from, from my experience and what's been published by the CDC and NIH, we want to give it as soon as there has been an exposure ideally between seven to 10 days after the exposure before you've developed any um, serious side of serious effects of COVID. So anyone who is whose oxygen levels are stable, whose heart rate and blood pressure is good, and we don't suspect any um, 
severe effects of COVID. So all these patients that have been coming to us who said that they've been exposed to COVID, if it's been within seven to 10 days and they are still otherwise doing relatively well, they have been candidates for monoclonal antibodies. Um, as far as the contents and, the, uh, and, and what is in the monoclonal antibody, that's proprietary. So I, I don't have full information about that. And I know you touched on this um, quite a bit throughout your presentation, um, but it doesn't hurt to reiterate it. Uh, one uh, individual is asking if they should get the vaccine, even though as a transplant recipient, they might not build antibodies to it. Correct. So that's a concern um, in all vaccinated uh, transplant recipients and also certain patients who are on treatments for other diseases which reduces their immunity. So in all of them, the answer is still, yes, you should go ahead and get vaccinated. Because like I said, um, whether the vaccine protects you or not is not a laboratory value. You can't go to the lab to measure your antibody levels to say you've been protected or not. Of course, the higher the antibody levels, we know that in the patients who are on immunosuppressants, their antibody levels are lower compared to someone who's not on any immunosuppression such as me. But we know that other than the antibody response, there's also a cellular response that the vaccines are able to elicit. And together, both of them are protective against the vaccine, against COVID. So yes, it is very important to get the vaccine, even if you think you did not, you would not mount an immune response uh, because of your conditions. And uh, one final question for you, and this is a little bit different um, from some of the other questions that we've had. Um, this person says, I am a kidney transplant patient and am now awaiting uh, my second transplant to happen within the next six months. I have had all three Pfizer vaccines. Are there pros or cons for me accepting a kidney from a donor who isn't vaccinated or who was given one of the other vaccines, um, like the Moderna vaccine? I think that's a, actually a very important question. And um, when the pandemic had started and we had briefly um, halted all organ procurements and transplants, and then when uh, we started uh, doing transplants again, one of the biggest question was, how do we make sure that we are not uh, putting the recipients at risk for COVID by getting organs from someone who may have had COVID. So there are two folds to this question. Can you get organ from someone who's had COVID? And do you can you get organ from someone who's not been vaccinated for COVID? So depending on who the donor is, if it is a deceased donor uh, from whom the organs are being procured, um, all the uh, organ procurement uh, organizations, the OPOs and UNOs have very have developed their own guidelines and they are making sure that the um, donors from whom the organs are being uh, procured, they are vigorously tested for COVID. They do even a bronchioalveolar lavage to make sure that they are COVID negative before they procure the organ. If this is a living donor from whom you're procuring the organ, um, the fact that they are going to donate the organ itself um, for them to undergo the surgery in itself for their own protection, it's better that they get vaccinated. For the recipient as such, we uh, before any patient undergoes any procedure, we do test them for COVID. So the living donor will definitely be tested for COVID before they are able to donate the organ to you. So for you to receive the organ from someone who is vaccinated or not vaccinated um, shouldn't really make a, much of a difference to you because you are vaccinated and you are protected and the donor who's going to donate to you will also be tested to make sure that they are not COVID positive so that they don't transmit the virus to you during the transplantation. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering all of these questions. We appreciate your time, Dr. Shanka, and, and appreciate you sharing your knowledge and expertise on this topic. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity, and I hope the information was useful and it will um, give more information and education to people who've been confused with all this data and information that's 
um, going on in news on social media and all these journals so hopefully you have more uh, knowledge now to ask the right questions and to make the right decisions to make sure that you are safe and everyone around you is also safe absolutely wonderful closing words thank you so much again dr shanka thank you uh, if if anyone has a question that we did not get to during today's webinar, we ask that you please reach out to us at info at aakp.org and we will work with today's speakers to provide a response. We hope you have found this webinar informational and I would like to close with a few slides about additional resources and services that may be of interest to you. If you are not already a member of AAKP, we encourage you to join us. We offer free membership to patients and family members, as well as living kidney donors. You can become a free member by joining us online at aakp.org or by giving us a call at 1-800-749-2257. To receive all of the benefits of membership, please be, ensure, please be sure to include your email address when signing up. As an AAKP member, you will be notified by email when opportunities arise where your opinions and experiences are needed to help inform innovation, advance care, and make a meaningful impact to improve lives. We encourage you to respond to our flash surveys and other engagement opportunities to help us elevate the patient voice and change the status quo for kidney disease care. You can also select to receive any of our five different electronic newsletters and subscribe to our print magazine, AAKP Renal Life. Please also follow us on our blog and social media for all the latest news and announcements. Next slide, please. AAKP is dedicated to helping patients understand their condition and take control of their health care. We are proud to offer a variety of resources for both patients and caregivers. By visiting our website at aakp.org and clicking on the AAKP store button at the top of the homepage, you can find a variety of educational brochures and online tools to order or download. You can also order materials by phone. We encourage you to visit our on-demand website where you can find educational sessions from our previous events. We have a plethora of resources on our coronavirus resources page available at this link or by clicking on the red button from our aakp.org homepage. The recording of this webinar will be made available on this page in the coming days. We'd again like to thank today's speaker, Dr. Shanka, for sharing with us information on COVID-19, vaccine doses, and monoclonal antibody treatment. Again, if you have any additional questions about what you heard on today's webinar, please send them to info at aakp.org and we will work to respond to those questions. Thank you again for joining us today. Be informed and stay safe.